Hi everyone, my name is Hadi Zafar, and welcome to First Aid Explained, where I, as a medical student, try my best to explain in depth every page of First Aid USMLE Step 1 2021. In this video, I'll be covering the biochemistry portion, pages 34 to 40. So let's begin. So here on the first page, we have something as the chromatin structure. Now before we can talk about this, we need to know what DNA is. Now DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule that carries instructions on how, when, and what kind of proteins the cell needs to make in order to live and perform its functions. The problem is, is that each DNA molecule is up to 2 meters in length. So our cells have tricks to compress all of that to fit inside our nucleus. That's where chromatin comes in. Now there are two types of chromatin. There's heterochromatin and euchromatin. Now heterochromatin appears darker on the electron microscope. Why? Because it's very condensed, meaning the DNA is wrapped very tightly and the genes on that DNA segment are rarely transcribed or basically used by the cell. Whereas euchromatin is less condensed and appears lighter on the electron microscope. A simple way to memorize this is that E in euchromatin is expressed and EU also means true, so truly transcribed. And heterochromatin, H for highly and C for condensed, so highly condensed. So let's dive deeper into the diagram itself. This is basically a zoomed in picture of a chromosome or a chromosome in the metaphase, which is in mitosis. We'll, we'll talk about this later. But for now, just know that this X shaped chromosome contains two sister chromatids. And once zoomed in, you can see that this is the heterochromatin, which is tightly packed and densed, and it's filled with these super coiled structures. Once you zoom in further, you can see how these DNA are wrapped around these circular objects. And this circular object is actually eight parts of a histone octamer. And the DNA wraps twice around it. So this whole structure of this histone octamer and these two DNA loops is called a nucleosome. And this whole structure kind of looks like beads on a string. Now once you further zoom in, you can see start to see the double DNA double helix. And all of this is coming from the chromosome itself. Now let's talk about DNA methylation. This is a process by which methyl groups are added to the DNA molecule. This can change the activity of a DNA seg segment without changing this sequence. Now, this occurs and has evolved with aging, carcinogenesis, genet genomic imprinting, and transposable element repression. Now, what causes DNA methylation is, is through many factors, one of, them, one of them being the aging process, environmental influences, and lifestyle factors, such as smoking and diet. Basically, DNA methylation regulates gene expression to put it into simple terms. Now, if this methylation occurs within the gene promoter, this typically silences gene transcription. So, to keep this in mind, methylation makes DNA mute. Now, there's something called as histone methylation. Now, this causes reversible transcriptional suppression. So, that means the histone methylation mostly makes DNA mute. Because though it can cause suppression, we can also cause activation depending on the location of the methyl groups present in the DNA segment. Then there's histone acetylation, which is removal of the histone's positive charge, relaxing the DNA coiling, leading to more transcription. So histone acetylation makes DNA active, A for A. Then there's histone deacetylation, which is the complete opposite. So it's the process of removal of acetyl groups tightening the DNA coiling, decreasing the chances of transcription. Now moving on. Here we have nucleotides. Now nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids, which are the fundamental building blocks for DNA and RNA. Now the most basic structure of a nucleotide can be broken down into three parts. The base, which can either be a purine or pyrimidine, also called as nucleobases, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then a five-carbon sugar, 
with either ribose for RNA and deoxyribose for DNA, and phosphate. Nucleoside is basically the same thing but without the phosphate. Now when it comes to bases or nucleobases, we have two main types. We have purines, which consists of A and G, which is adenine and guanine, and pyrimidines, which is cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Now purines are made up of two rings, you can see here, whereas pyrimidines are made up of one ring. To remember this, remember that purines are pure as gold. Pure for purines, A for adenine, and G for guanine. Whereas pyrimidines are cut the pyramid or cut the pie. So cytosine, uracil, thymine, and PYR for pyrimidines. Now keep in mind, when the double helix is formed, these bases are joined together through hydrogen bonds. And remember that between cytosine and guanine, there are three hydrogen bonds, making them stronger. Whereas between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds. To remember this, just remember that between C and G bonds, there are three hydrogen bonds, making them strong, such as like crazy glue. So you can see in this diagram that this is a nucleoside, which can, can consists of the nitrogenous base and just a deo the deoxyribose sugar, whereas a nucleotide contains the same thing but plus a phosphate group. Now this will come in handy for later. Just remember that for purine synthesis, the mnemonic, you could say, are cats per until they gag. So these are the amino acids necessary for purine synthesis. G stands for glycine, and then A stands for aspartate, and then the other G stands for glutamine. Now, moving on. Now on this page, we'll be talking about how our cells make nucleotides. Now one way is to make them from scratch, also called as the de novo synthesis. And the other is to the salvage pathway that recycles nucleotides that are already semi-degraded, which will come in a bit. Now the de novo synthesis for both pyrimidine and purine synthesis starts with ribose 5-phosphate. And this ribose 5-phosphate comes from another intracellular metabolic pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. Now an enzyme called ribose phosphate pyrophosphokinase uses an ATP molecule and it removes two phosphate groups from it, attaching them to the ribose 5-phosphate, creating a phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP. Now this PRPP is used later for both pyrimidine and purine synthesis. Now let's talk about pyrimidine production. To start off with, you need glutamate, bicarbonate, water, and ATP. An enzyme called carbon carbamol phosphate synthase 2 helps create carbamol phosphate, which is later joined with aspartate to make aerotic acid. Next, an enzyme called UMP synthase converts this aerotic acid into UMP, or uridine monophosphate. This UMP gets later phosphorylated into UDP, and either with the help of CTP synthase, gets converted into cytosine triphosphate, or with the help of ribonucleotide reductase, it gets converted to deoxyuridine diphosphate, which is later used in a, as an energy source in other cellular reactions, and thereby loses two more phosphates. Now, purine synthesis is a bit more complex, however, but remember the mnemonic we discussed earlier, that in purine synthesis, cats purr until they gag. So they use glycine, aspartate, and glutamate, with the help of PRPP, that starts the whole purine base production. And through a 10-step pathway, the formation of IMP occurs. IMP is inosine monophosphate, which is a sort of generic purine. From there, it either gets converted to GMP, which is guanosine monophosphate, or AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Now, these are some of the drugs that inhibit certain pa parts of the pathway of either pyrimidine synthesis or purine synthesis. Keep in mind that 6-MP inhibits de novo purine synthesis, 
and 5-fluorouracil inhibits pyrimidine synthesis. The rest are also important to remember. Keep in mind that in the disease called aortic aciduria, UMP synthase is impaired, which leads to the buildup of high levels of aortic acid in the urine. Alright, moving on. On to the purine salvage and degradation pathways. Now, pyrimidine rings, C, T, and U, can be degraded completely back down into carbon dioxide and ammonia, which can then be excreted through exhalation from the lungs and into the urine. In contrast, however, purine rings, guanine and adenine, cannot be broken down in this quite the same way. Instead, they're degraded down to the metabolically inert uric acid, which is then excreted into the urine. Now for GMP to become uric acid, the enzyme purine nucleoside phosphorylate removes the ribose and the phosphate from it, leading it to become guanosine, and then guanine. From there, an enzyme called guanase removes an amine group, turning guanine into xanthine. Xanthine is oxidized through the enzyme xanthine oxidase, turning it into uric acid. On the other hand, AMP, to be, for it to become uric acid, the first enzyme, convert, which is called adenosine deaminase, converts AMP to IMP. From there, it follows the same pathway, turning it into hypoxanthine, then xanthine, then uric acid. Now, it turns out that those intermediate molecules in purine degradation, guanine and hypoxanthine, can be restored into fresh nucleic acids through what is known as the salvage pathway. Now, the enzyme hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, or HGPRT for short, returns ribose and phosphate back to guanine to make it back to GMP, and from hypoxanthine to IMP. From there, IMP can go back to AMP, or through adenine with the help of PRPP, can go back to AMP as well. Now, a genetic disease called lech nyen syndrome is characterized by a complete absence of HGPRT, and this result leads to too much buildup of uric acid being produced by the purine degradation. The lech nyen syndrome leads to a number of symptoms, such as self mutilation, aggression, gout, hyperuricemia, red and orange crystals in urine, and dystonia, or tense muscles. To remember this, just remember HGPRT. Now the treatment for this is allopurinol, or febroxostat. And keep in mind for the US Mill exam is that dystonia is the most common presenting symptom in Lesch 9 syndrome. The other findings will include in touch intellectual disability, and macrocytosis. Then there's something called as adenosine dia diaminase deficiency, which is an autosomal recessive genetic disease resulting in the defect in genes coding for the adenosine diaminase enzyme. The result of ADA is the increased accumulation of deoxyadenosine triphosphate, which interferes with normal DNA replication. And this causes the collapse of our lymphocyte immune system by disabling its proliferation. This leads to severe combined immunodeficiency called ADA-SCID, which unfortunately has a poor prognosis. Treatment options in this disease involve hemopoietic stem cell transplants or lifelong enzyme replacement therapy. Now we, here we have the features of genetic code. And remember that each codon specifies only one amino acid. However, most amino acids are coded by multiple codons. Now, wobble codons differ in the third wobble position. They may code for the same tRNA or amino acid. However, the exceptions are AUG and UGG, as they're only encoded by one codon. Now, genes are read from a fixed starting point as a continuous sequence of bases. An exception of this in reality are some viruses. And genetic code is conserved throughout evolution. This means that throughout evolution, our genes haven't changed as much over time. Now, the exception in this in humans is mitochondria. Okay, moving on. Now, on to DNA replication. 
Now, DNA replication can be called as semi-conservative. That means that each strand of the double helix acts as a template based on which a new complementary strand will form. Eventually, the original chromosome will split into two exact copies, each made of one of the original strands, and the one of the newly made ones. Now, overall, DNA replication has three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. Now, initiation kicks off when a group of proteins get together to form a pre-replication complex. Now, this pre-replication complex looks for specific nucleotide sequences along the DNA strand, called origins of replication. Now, there are multiple sites of origin of replication on the single strand of DNA. Why? Because our DNA molecule, like we said before, is really long. So a single DNA strand has multiple sites of replication. So replication begins simultaneously along the strand itself. Now these sequences of origin replication are rich in AT, such as Tata box regions, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Now these AT rich sequences are only joined by two hydrogen bonds. So the, now the DNA, the DNA enzyme helicase has a relatively easy time separating the two strands. Now this separation leads to something called a replication fork, with the two prongs of the fork being the two strands that are separate from one another. Now single strands of DNA can get a bit unstable, so to help keep them from getting back together again, helper molecules called single-stranded binding proteins come in and bind to each of the lonely strands. Also, as while DNA helicase breaks down bonds, the segments of DNA ahead of it start to overwind, meaning the double helix becomes more tightly wound, creating something as supercoils. That's where the DNA topoisomerase comes in, and this works ahead in front of DNA helicase to loosen up the supercoils. Now the second step is elongation. And for that, we need a new enzyme called primase. So what this does, it randomly hovers and synthesizes small lengths of RNA, which are only a few nucleotides long, called RNA primers. That's where DNA polymerase can initiate replication, where it can add more complementary nucleotides to the template strand. Now, the DNA polymerase moves from 3' prime to 5' prime along the template, st template strand. And this new strand is formed called the leading strand. Now the problem starts for the other DNA template strand that runs from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. That's because RNA primer is facing anti-parallel. So what RNA primer does, sorry, RNA primase, it lays down a number of primers that bind to different spots along the length of the DNA template strand. This offers a lot of three prime ends, where DNA polymerase can then add nucleotides to the three prime ends of each of these primers. We call these growing fragments of Zaki fragments, and they grow away from the replication fork until they meet up. Now, DNA polymerase can't join these Zaki fragments, so with the help of DNA ligase, it helps finish off the lagging strand. Now the final step of DNA replication is termination. At the end of the chromosome is a region of DNA where there are repeating sequences of TTAGGG. This part of the DNA sequence is called telomerase. This sequence of TTAGG signals the DNA polymerase to hop off of the strand right before replicating the DNA right up to the very end. Think of telomeres as plastic bits on, on the shoelace. That is only job is to protect the shoelace itself. To remember this, telomerase tags for greatness and glory. So T T A G G G. Okay, great. Moving on. Now we have DNA repair. So when it comes to DNA damage, there either might be single-strand damage or double-strand damage. So let's talk about single-stranded damage first. 
Now there are three repair mechanisms involved. Mismatch repair, base excision repair, and nucleotide excision repair. Now during replication, DNA polymerase can sometimes put in the wrong nucleotide, like pairing adenine up with cytosine instead of thymine. This is called mismatch. And this happens around 60,000 times per replication. So one out of 100,000 nucleotides. And the first way to fix a mismatch is to fix it right after it happens because DNA polymerase is quite a resourceful enzyme and can look over its shoulder to check for errors and see if, to, if it can put the right nucleotide in. So mismatch repair happens to newly synthesized unmyelated strands of DNA. So what DNA polymerase do is when it finds a mismatch, it goes and removes it and replaces the wrong nucleotide with the correct one. This process is called proofreading. So you can see here, pretty simple. Now base excision repair comes in handy when the cell's DNA suffers damage from exposure to harmful chemicals or physical factors. For example, chemicals like nitrates which are found in cured or pickled foods. And this can cause deamination, which changes the molecular structure of the nitrogen base. Now, base excision repair relies on an enzyme called glycosylase, and these help remove the damaged base and leave behind a tiny gap in the nucleotide, called an AP site, which is here, right here. An enzyme called AP endonuclease severs the bond between the phosphate and sugar from the other nucleotides. After that, an exonuclease removes them, leaving a gap in the damaged DNA strand. From there, DNA polymerase fills the gap and DNA ligase seals it. And this process occurs throughout the cell cycle. So remember the mnemonic gel please. G standing for glyco glycolase removing the altered base and creating an AP site. E for AP endonucleases, which cleaves the 5' prime end, AP lase, or exonuclease, which cleaves the 3' prime end, and then DNA polymerase, which fills the gap, and then DNA ligase, which seals it. Then we have nucleotide excision repair, and this process fixes damaged DNA from physical agents like harmful UV radiation. Now UV radiation, or UV exposure, creates pyrimidine dimers, mo most, often be most often between two adjacent thymines. Now these two thymines form bonds between each other, distorting the DNA strand in that region of the molecule. So nucleotide excision repair relies on endonucleases that make two incisions of the DNA strand, here and here, leaving a fragment of 12, 24 nucleotides with free ends. Where exonucleases come in hand and remove the nucleotides. Finally, DNA polymerase inserts new nucleotides and DNA ligase seals the bonds once again. Now this was all single-stranded repair. And before we move on to double strand, keep in mind that nucleotide excision repair happens in the G1 phase of the cell cycle and is defected in xeroderma pigmentosa. Now moving on to double strand damage. There are two mechanisms involved, non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. And the most common among them is the non-homologous end joining, where a co uh, protein complex called DNA protein kinase begins by binding to each end of the broken DNA. Now this process is defective in ataxia telectasia, and some DNA may be lost. Now moving on to homologous recombination, now how this works is that our 46 chromosomes come in 23 pairs of two homologous chromosomes, which code for the same traits and therefore have similar nucleotide sequences. As a result, a double strand break on one of the chromosomes can be repaired by using the sister chromatid. First, a protein complex called MRN binds to each end of the broken DNA and recruits exonucleases that remove nucleotides from one strand of the DNA. To make the process more clear, we can call the ends of the broken DNA end 1 and end 2. So now, end 1 is placed near a similar nucleotide sequence called homologous sequence. Because it's found on the same spot 
on the homologous sister chromatin. And one then pairs up with the complementary strand of the intact homologous DNA region, creating a loop in the homologous DNA. Then a DNA polymerase synth synthesizes nucleotides to extend N1 until it reaches a sequence that is complementary to N2. Then N1 releases the homologous DNA and its last few nucleotides bind to the last nucleotides of N2. Finally, DNA polymerases fills the gap on both sides of the N uh, union and DNA ligase seals the bond. Now, since homologous recombination uses a sister chromatid as a template, this is more reliable repair mechanism than non-homologous end joining because there's no loss of DNA. However, this is defective in breast ovarian cancers with BRCA1 mutations and in Falconi anemia. And now moving on. So, finally, we have mutations in DNA. Now, often, mutations occur during DNA replication, which happens right before a cell divides. Now, three common types of DNA mutation include substitutions, insertions, and deletions. So let's talk about substitutions. So when a nucleotide is swapped or substituted for a different one, like, for example, swapping U for A or a G for a C, the result or complication depends on whether that the swap results in a new amino acid. And if it did, what matters is how the new amino acid affects the overall folding and function of the protein. For example, let's take the codon UGU, which codes for the amino acid cysteine. A point mutation in the last U for a C results in the codon UGC, which also codes for cysteine. So in this case, the resulting protein isn't changed at all, and this mutation doesn't have a functional consequence. So this is called as a silent mutation, which has here codes for the same amino acid. Now, instead, let's say that our UGU codon, there was a point mutation in the last U for an A, which is now called as UGA, which is a stop codon. A stop codon makes the ribosome stop building the protein, and this kind of mutation is called a nonsense mutation as it results in a much shorter protein that can't properly function. So like we said in our example, UGA, other stop codons are UAA, UAG. Now let's say our UGU codon had another point mutation and replaced the G for A, leading to UAU. Now this codes for an amino acid called tyrosine which is different from cysteine. So this is called a misses, min, misses, missense mutation. Now depending on the amino acid it codes for, missense mutations can be conservative or non-conservative. Conservative means that the resulting protein can still function properly because the switch coded for amino acid with similar chemical properties to the original one. So in this case, both cysteine and tyrosine are polar amino acids so the protein can still pretty, function pretty well. But now let's say UGU, there was a point mutation for the last U for G, leading to UGG, which codes for the amino acid tryptophan, which is a non-polar amino acid. This re results in the protein not being able to function properly. And this is exactly what happens in sickle cell anemia, where the substitution of glutamic acid with valine occurs. So that was substitutions. Now there's deletions and assertions. If these are mutations on the multiples of three nucleotides, then there will be a displace the reading frame of mRNA codons exactly by one entire codon. For example, let's say you add three or six nucleotides or take away three or six nucleotides. That means that the majority of the protein will have the same amino acids with only a few added or taken away. That's called a non frame shift mutation. If the deletions or insertions are not in the multiples of three, like adding one, 
two or four or five nucleotides or taking away one, two, four or five nucleotides, then it's called a frame shift mutation. So a deletion or insertion of any number of nucleotides not divisible by, th by three. This leads to a misreading of all the nucleotides downstream. So the protein may be shorter or longer, and its function may be disrupted or altered. For example, in Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy or Tay-Sachs disease. Now there is something called a splice site mutation. And this is a genetic alteration in the DNA sequence that occurs at the boundary of an exon and an intron, which is the splice site. This change can disrupt RNA splicing resulting in the loss of exons or the inclusion of introns and thus leading to an altered protein coding sequence. So now out of all of these mutations, the most se severe one is frame shift mutations. And obviously, the mutation that has the least amount of complications is the silent mutation. Okay, let's talk about the lac operon model. The lac operon is a set of genes in E. coli, and that's responsible for the breakdown of lactose. This is a classic example of genetic response to environmental change. So now for E. coli, glucose is always the preferred metabolic substrate. But when glucose is absent and lactose is available, the lac operon is activated to switch to lactose metabolism. So in conditions of high lactose and low glucose, allolactose binds to something called as a repressor protein, which leads to the repressor protein unbinding from the operator site, resulting in the increased transcriptions of LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. And these three segments lead to the production of proteins that are useful in lactose metabolism. Also, when there's low glucose, there's a lot of CAP, which is catabolite activator protein, which binds the CAMP, and together with the help of RNA polymerase, transcribes LAC-ZYA more effectively. CAP basically helps DNA polymerase to do its job of transcribing these LAC-ZYA segments more effectively. In conditions of high glucose and low lactose, cap levels will remain low. The repressor stays bound to the operator and RNA polymerase is blocked from transcribing the genes necessary for lactose metabolism. So when there's the only a presence of allolactose, meaning high lactose but low glucose, then this lac opera model gets activated. All right, that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this helped. Thank you. See you guys again next time. Bye-bye.